And now, I was eager to preach this sermon, but now it's time. So, <laughs> Mother's Day. Wonderful Mother's Day, May 14th, 2017. How we praise God for his grace and mercy to us in giving us mothers, and in most cases, mothers who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who exemplified him for us in the way in which they raised us. I praise God for my mother, truly a woman of God. I buried her this past fall, 96 years old, a woman who had lived for Jesus Christ all of her life, set the example for her children, taught us and disciplined us according to the scripture and how we praise God for each of our mothers. I said to you a few moments ago, and I'll begin there again, today is Mother's Day, but not an ancient holiday, not a worldwide holiday. In fact, it's not even a holiday celebrated in the rest of the English-speaking world, although some Americans have carried it abroad. It was first instituted in the United States in 1907, but not recognized by Congress until 1914, a year of significant import leading up to the First World War. It's celebrated on the second Sunday in May this year, May 14th. In 1914, when it was officially named a holiday by Congress, it fell just one month before the spark that ignited World War I. The Germans sank the Lusitania on May 7th, 1915, shortly before Mother's Day of that year. But President Woodrow Wilson refused to enter the war. By February 1, 1917, when Germany declared an unlimited submarine campaign with the right to sink American ships and the deliberate sinking of U.S. merchant vessels, plus Germany's attempt to bring Mexico into the war against the United States, President Wilson could hesitate no longer. On April 6, one month before Mother's Day, the United States entered the war against Germany. On November 14th, the Eastern Forces under Gen General Allenby took the city of Jaffa in Israel and turned inland to march on Jerusalem, which was held by the Muslim Turks. On December 9th, 1917, Allenby got off his horse, walked through the gates of Jerusalem, declaring that the only conqueror that could enter the city on a horse was our Lord Jesus Christ. And for the first time in 400 years, the city was no longer in Muslim hands. World War I is thus a major marker for Jerusalem, and also a marker for us, as we'll see in a few moments, in relation to Mother's Day. American mothers had lost sons in other wars, but not on the scale of loss experienced in World War I. It was in that war that American mothers first began to realize the massive loss of sons and husbands, fathers and grandsons. It was the mothers whose losses in the trenches of Europe came to the saddened attention of the American people and solidified this holiday in American love and thought. How did it happen? On June 28, 1914, Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. Exactly one month later, Austria-Hungary declared war against Serbia. Serbia appealed to its ally, Russia, the same day, July 29th, an Imperial Council at Potsdam decided on war against Russia and as a corollary against France. On July 31st, Russia ordered a general mobilization and Germany, taking equivalent steps, sent a 12-hour ultimatum. By noon on August 1st, a state of war existed between Russia and Germany, and the next day, German troops entered French territory. At 7 p.m. that same day, Germany sent an ultimatum to Belgium, demanding unopposed passage. On August 3rd, Germany's formal declaration of war on France followed, and on August 4th, German troops crossed, crossed the Belgian frontier for the sanctity of which England stood as a guarantor. At midnight, in reply, England also entered the war. Truly, Mother's Day was born on the eve before what was called the war to end all wars. I think it is therefore fitting that our text for today, and we've read three of them, there are many more, but those three stand out, that those texts speak of the struggle and agony of motherhood. Let me read again the central verses in each of those passages before us today. Because there is a struggle going on, 
There are birth pangs, just as the world was going through birth pangs at the outset of World War I. Just as there was a war between the nations in 1914 through 1918, so there's a war between the descendant of two other mothers, those who are born of the spirit and those who are born of the flesh. Genesis 3.16 Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Luke 2 And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again. Notice the order, not the rising and fall, but the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. And then he tells her what she is going to have to go through as the mother. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And then to John 19, we see where the sword pierced through Mary's soul. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. There are many other passages in scripture that speak of the agony of motherhood. Some of these passages Use childbirth to describe the panicked, screaming anguish of nations coming under the judgment of God. Some passages also use the agony of childbirth to describe what the world, the earth itself, must yet in the future suffer in Scripture. In other words, the agony and suffering of childbearing and of raising children has prophetic and eschatological significance in a very graphic sense. Just as the agony of motherhood and childbirth go all the way back to the fall and the curse upon the earth, even so the earth itself must go through the agony of childbirth. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 16. The Spirit itself also beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now listen to verses 18 and 19. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering precedes joy. Suffering precedes joy glory. And he tells us about that in relation to the entire creation, taking us back to the fall and the curse that was placed upon Adam and Eve. For the earnest expectation of the creature, that's the word creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. There's going to become, there's come a birth, a manifestation, a showing forth of some children here. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered, 
These are all childbirth terms, folks. From the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That's the word for going through the pains of childbirth. It groans, it travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Those of you who have had children know you've got to wait nine months. (laughs) Forty weeks. You look forward with anticipation, with eagerness. You hope. You don't yet see. And before modern technology, you couldn't even know whether it was a boy or a girl. But you were hoping. You were looking forward to the birth of a baby. And sometimes you get surprised with two of them, or three, or some people even had four. You wait patiently because there is hope. But then you have to go through the suffering And then there is the point of joy breaking forth. Mothers give to us that picture. A picture that is found throughout scripture in many different contexts as we'll see. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings. I was with my wife for the birth of all 13 of our children. I know what those groanings sound like. The agony and the pain. The Holy Spirit is making groanings for us. And Paul talks about travailing as in childbirth until Christ be formed in us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Jesus said that joy follows the birth of the child. And that's what makes going through the suffering worthwhile. Even so, there is a glorious anticipation of joy, although the earth must first go through the suffering of the tribulation. Let me show you a few of the passages where the agony of motherhood is described and realize the joy that follows in spite of the pain. Look at the twins born to Tamar. You know the sordid story, it's in Genesis 38, where Judah, after the death of his second son, does not want to give his third son to Tamar. And Tamar sees it's not going to happen, and she wants children, so she plays the part of a prostitute. And Judah goes into her and then sends back later by the, friend of his, by the hand of his friend uh, the, the payment. And she's not there. But before he left, she told him she would take a surety for the coming of the little baby goat that was going to come as, as payment. She took his staff and she took his signet ring. And when the friend came back, she wasn't there. And a few months later... Somebody told Judah, well, your, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot and she's with child. And he said, well, bring her out and we're going we're gonna to burn her. And she comes forth and she says, by the man who owns these am I pregnant. And she had Judah's staff and his signet. And he admitted that he was guilty. And she bore twins. How can God bring something good out of something so evil. Let me read you the passage. It came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his head a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. 
And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Ferez, which means a breach, a breaking forth. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah, which means seed. But God had a purpose in Ferez being born first. Because Ferez was the ancestor of David, and thus the ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was truly a cause for joy and rejoicing. God taking that which was evil, bringing suffering about, and then ultimately bringing forth the Messiah who would redeem us from the curse. The curse placed on us at the fall of Adam, the curse placed on us under the law. And Christ redeemed us from them both. Travail in childbirth is also portrayed as the precursor to joy in multiple passages in the Bible. First, that travail is an example, is the messianic promise of joy Christ experienced after the cross in bringing many sons to glory. When you come to the preparatory services, I often read Isaiah chapter 53. It is a great messianic passage in the Old Testament. It's a passage that if you read it to a Jew who doesn't know his Bible, and you read it to them, you ask him, who is this speaking about? He'll say, oh, that's your Jesus. And then you point him to the fact that it was written by Isaiah 800 years before Jesus was born. This is in Isaiah 53. He shall see of the travail of his soul. The cross has just been described in the preceding verses. That is anguish, that is suffering, that is pain, that is sorrow. That is the cursing and the mocking of Jew and Gentile alike and the spitting upon him and the beating of him and the plaiting of the crown of thorns and the placing of the purple robe in mockery, the agony of the nails in his hands and feet, and the rough wood of the cross, and the crowd standing below and jeering at him. It's the agony that we saw in his eyes as he looks at his mother, and as he looks at John, the beloved disciple. And as he commits the care of his mother, knowing that he is dying, he commits the care of his mother to the man who is perhaps his best friend. That's suffering, people. But listen to what the rest of the verse says in Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And here's how Hebrews takes that passage. Hebrews 2.10, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. The cross had to precede the joy of bringing many sons to glory. The cross had to precede the joy of your salvation and mine. The suffering had to precede the peace and glory of heaven. And the words that are used are the words that are used of a, of a woman in travail, in the birth pangs, giving birth to a child. It's love that makes her go through that. It was love that my wife showed 
but she wanted as many children as God would give us. After the first one, she knew what it was like. There may be some young woman, innocent in her thoughts, that this won't be too bad. But after she gives birth to her first child, she knows the suffering that you have to go through. And yet many go through it over and over and over again. The suffering, the sorrow. For as Jesus said, and then she forgets it because of the joy that as a man is born into the world. Those of you who have been mothers know the joy of holding a dear baby in your arms. I remember the joy that Judy had as she held each one of our dear sweet little children. Now they're not dear sweet little children anymore, but when they were babies they were dear sweet little children. Travail must precede joy. Second, travail in childbirth is not only a portrayal that the joy that Christ experienced after the cross in bringing many sons to glory, but second, travail in childbirth is also portrayed as the precursor to joy in anticipation of the rebirth of Israel, many times in the Old Testament. I hope you read the insert that you have in your bulletin today because today we celebrate the 69th anniversary of the birth of Israel in May 14th, 1948. May 14th, today is... Uh, Israel's Independence Day. This is the day that Israel was a nation born in a day as prophesied in the Old Testament. Born in a day. And immediately, all of its Arab neighbors declared war on Israel. They're outnumbered more than 100 to 1 and they won that war. All of their Arab neighbors had all of the modern tanks and equipments and everything that was turned over to them by the European nations that had been in those areas, and Israel basically had one armored car and a zip gun. Israel won, a nation born in a day. But travail in childbirth is also portrayed as the precursor to joy in anticipation of the rebirth of Israel. Again from Isaiah chapter 54, the very next chapter. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not prevail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. In that context, the nations of the earth are in travail, like a woman giving birth when God shows his blessing on Israel. One of the most beautiful of the Psalms gives us this theme. Psalm 48, a song and psalm for the sons of Korah, those are the priests. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, and in the mountain of his holiness. That's Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Fear took hold upon them there, and pain as of a woman in travail. Here's God blessing Israel. Here's God establishing Jerusalem. Here's God making the capital of his nation. Here's God defending the Jews. And it tells you when God does that, that the nations that surround it will be in pain like birth pangs, the pain of travail as of a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of God, God will establish it forever, Selah. Now, in case you didn't get that last word, it said forever. The church has not replaced Israel. God made a forever promise to Israel that Jerusalem is her capital, whether the nations of the world want to admit it or not. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. 
That's why the nations tremble. Walk about Zion. Go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark ye well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. There are many, many passages. We won't be able to read them all. Our time is flying. But many passages speak of judgment both of Israel and of the nations and use the picture of birth pangs, of a woman in travail giving birth to a baby. Jeremiah 4.31, many in Jeremiah. In fact, more than half of them that I have here are in Jeremiah. So I'll just read a few. Uh, Jeremiah 4.31, for I've heard the voice of, as of a woman in travail and the anguish of her as that bringeth forth her first child. The voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. Judgment both on Israel and on the nations. God uses birth pangs to describe how it feels. Chapter 6, 24, we have heard the fame thereof, our hands wax feeble, anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain as of a woman in travail. Chapter 13, 21, what wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains, and be chief over thee, shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? Chapter 22, 23, O inhabitant of Lebanon, thou that makest thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shalt thou be when pangs come upon thee, the pain as of a woman in travail. Chapter 30, verse 6, Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Men going through such agony and pale, pain as they see the judgments of God, they're feeling the pain of birth. Chapter 49, Damascus is waxed feeble and turneth herself to flee. Fear hath seized on her, anguish and sorrows have taken her, as a woman in travail. Chapter 50, verse 43, the kings of Babylon have heard the report of them. His hands wax feeble, anguish took hold upon him in the pangs as of a woman in travail. Let me just give you a couple more out of Micah. Chapter 4, verse 9, why dost thou cry aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. Chapter 4, verse 10, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, thou shalt dwell in the field, thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemy. You get the idea. God uses the picture of becoming a mother, going through the birth pains, going through labor. Sometimes it's very intensive. Some women go through labor day after day after day to portray that he will judge the nations. He has chastened his own daughter, Jerusalem, the Israelis. They have yet a time coming where it will be like great travail and pain. Most of the book of Revelation is about that. But there will be a deliverance. The glorious millennial reign of Christ will come to the earth after Israel has gone through the final ultimate birth pangs. And during that time, when the Antichrist seeks to kill every Jew alive on the face of the earth, many will be saved, but they will go through the birth pangs, and then they will be delivered. And Christ will establish his glorious millennial rule in Jerusalem an incredible picture. It goes back to the fall. It takes us all the way through the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. Those pictures are used in both situations. It takes us to the judgment of the nations. It takes us to the final judgment of the nations and the final chastening of Israel and brings us to joy. There's a lot of suffering and sorrow in motherhood. I know, I watched for more than 40 years as my dear wife went through the sorrow and suffering of motherhood and of raising children, of praying for them, of disciplining them, of sometimes seeing them begin to wobble off the path and then by the grace of God come back. I heard her prayers for we prayed intensely every morning and all through the day for our kids. 
She was much more tender than I am. Much more willing to forgive when I wanted to come down hard on them. The agony of motherhood. It's a picture for us that God gives us so that we will understand his grace and his mercy to those who are his children and his judgment upon who any who would hurt or harm his children in any way. You know, about a week ago, my daughter-in-law, Bethany, she gave birth to a tiny little boy by cesarean. This is just about a week ago. Ariel and Bethany named him Josiah Christian. And that announcement was in the bulletin last week, I believe. You know, there was agony and suffering in the bringing forth of that dear little boy. Agony and suffering. But now there is incredible joy. You know, I had the privilege of holding him and kissing him gently just a few days ago when driving back from the graduation of Anatolian Megali down at Pensacola Christian College. That dear little baby is still in intensive care because he was born more than a month early. But already they took him out of that, you know, incubator kind of a thing. He was lying in there and Ariel uh, opened the doors to the thing and carefully wrapped him up and detached all the little hoses that were attached to him and wrapped him gently and took him out and then handed him to me. Oh, people, what joy. What joy that a child is born. You know something, his personality already shows that he's going to be a very happy and pleasant child. It was such a delight to me that when I laughed, he actually broke into a big smile several times. Every time I laughed, he would smile. His eyes were closed, but he would smile. Big, huge smile, teeny tiny little baby. You know what? There's joy after the birth of the child even though there was suffering going through the birth. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 21. A woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. The suffering comes first, but God guarantees the joy that follows. Paul writes this in Galatians 4.19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. Those are developmental terms as a baby is being developed in the womb and then finally is brought forth. He's travailing for them. A pastor, an evangelist, an elder who loves his people will go through that kind of travail as he begs the Heavenly Father to cause Christ to be formed in the people that God has entrusted to him. Do you know that's how I pray for you? Many times I feel like I'm going through childbirth. And how I still pray for you because the labor is still going on. Listen to how he describes it to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Bearing Christian witness in this world is like childbirth and that's why most of us don't do it because it's hard it's painful it's time consuming and then when you bring somebody into the world you got to raise them 
We go through labor and travail to see the birth of new Christians and then to see their growth. In 2 Thessalonians 3.8, Neither did we eat the bread, any man's bread for naught, but we wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable unto you. You know, some labors go on more than 24 hours. It's night and day. And sometimes night and day again. And sometimes night and day again. Finally, judgment is coming on the earth as suddenly as birth pangs. Chapter 5 of 2 Thessalonians. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But there's going to be a day when the glory shines forth And John writes it in Revelation 3. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. When a child is born, he's given a name, isn't he? There's still pain and travail coming during the tribulation. But following that is a name and glory and joy and peace. And it's put in the context of marriage. Beautiful pictures in scripture because verse 2 says of 21, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Down to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. God has promises for Israel. God has promises for the church. And you know, when a man and a woman get married, the normal expectation is children. There is travail. There is childbirth. Today we honor our mothers. We honor those of you who are mothers and grandmothers because you have gone through that. But on the other side of it, there's joy. There's hope. There's anticipation for the future. There is glory to follow. There is service for Christ. And how we praise God for the mothers who have given to us, after they've gone through that suffering, that hope for the future and glory in the presence of Jesus. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you, Father, for our mothers who have suffered so much who have gone through all the difficulties of conception and pregnancy and childbirth. And then instead of rejecting us because we caused them pain, they loved us. They cared for us. They nurtured us. They gently kissed our wounds. They gave us an example They stood as our protectors. They helped us. They sacrificed for us so that we might be where we are today. Father, for those who are still alive, we pray for your blessings upon them. Those who've gone before have received the glory. They've stepped out of the world of travail and pain and childbirth and suffering, and they've stepped into the glory which yet awaits us. Father, thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you for our mothers. Thank you for those who hear our mothers, for those who yet perhaps someday will be married and become mothers. We pray for your blessing, your protection, your wisdom for each of them, that in all that they do, they might glorify Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 451, A Christian Home.